You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 67, Talking in Our Sleep with Jeff Rouse of Spear Education. In this episode, we join Jeff Rouse of Spear Education live at the 2018 Voices of Dentistry Conference in Arizona. As one of the key developers of the widely praised Seattle Protocol of Managing Airway Dysfunction, Dr. Rouse has the authority to make some sweeping statements about who should be leading the way in helping to treat these patients. Who should be on the team? How early should we start treating airway? When will medicine realize the scope of this problem? We get some answers this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call one 800 472 8302 today. That's 1 800 472 8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. Okay, well, welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And this week's episode, uh, in fact, we're at the Voices of Dentistry right now. Yeah. And uh, this is amazing. We have Dr. Jeff Roush with us, and, and we'll introduce him just in a second. But I want to thank uh, Kittenbach for coming on board and sponsoring The Dental Guys live stream here at the Voices of Dentistry. It's brought to you by Kittenbach. And, you know, one thing, John, that I did here about a month and a half ago is I was challenged to use some of their alginate replacement materials yeah. and in the past I've struggled with that and moving away from alginate for you know preliminary impressions things like that study models and the thing about alginate is you got to pour it up very soon you can't overnight it anywhere and so I was challenged to try the Silgenaut mm -hmm. uh, strawberry they have strawberry flavor it mm. is fantastic it's a true alginate alternative and I'm using it right now for anterior discluding devices I'm using it for my interim splints where I'm trying to get people treated something that Jeff is is privy to is taking an impression and it's great that my assistants if we take a 430 impression Impression that they don't have to stay around and pour that thing up yeah. and so they can wait till the next day so it works with our mixing machines like the the Pinamix and it's cost effective that was one thing that was kind of a big deal for me yep. and and so we sent it to Brad the dental lab guy and we had him analyze it under a microscope and he says the best algae replacement material he's seen that's impressive and so this is from Kittenbach and you know we're all about supporting the people that are direct to sales and it's by direct or by smart by direct Kittenbach. And if you need to reach out to someone, we want you to reach out to Eric Cortez at 1 877 532 2123. You can reach him there. We want you to buy, uh, and, and we want you to go buy and check them out. And yeah. We want you to support the Kittenbach. It's a good company, it's a good product. Good company, good product. So, John, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Roush to the show. And let me just tell you a little bit about Jeff. If you're new to Jeff, Jeff, you uh, maintain. A private practice in San Antonio, but yet you're tied here with uh, Frank Spear and uh, Dr. Greg Kinzer, but you're also um, as an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Prosthodontics at the University of Texas uh, Health Science Center there in San Antonio, San Antonio. So among his dental accolades, he has written numerous journal articles, including a portion of the annual review of the select dental literature published each summer in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. Which we love the annual review, JPD. By the way. Is love like, it. I'm yeah, serious. We have, a JP. we have a show every year <laughs> yeah. where we talk about. I didn't yeah. think anybody read it. Oh, oh dude, we read it. Uh, we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Two guys. Yeah. So, <laughs> most recently, he wrote a textbook um, by Quintessence titled "Global Diagnosis: A New Vision of Dental Diagnosis and Treatment Planning." After graduating dental school in San Antonio, Dr. Rouse completed a two-year general practice residency at the University of Kinetic Health Science Center. My alma mater, by yep, the way. And I did a GPR as well. So he practiced uh, family dentistry for 12 years before returning to school to earn his specialty certificate in prosthodontics from the Uni University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio in 2004. And then most recently, you became a member of the Spear resident faculty, teaching seminars and workshops focusing on airway prosthodontics, the implant or the impact 
that a compromised airway has on the stomatonathic system, along with fellow faculty member Dr. Greg Kinzer, you've developed what has been coined the Seattle Protocol to recognize, control, and direct resolution of airway distress within a restorative-driven practice. We'd like to welcome J Dr. Jeff Rouse to the show. That was long. We could, we're pretty much done, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> no, no. you are, man. Yeah. And that was good. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for being on. Yeah, yeah. It was. It is a lot because. You know, we, uh, you've been a, a, a real influence on us and a lot Big of our time. listeners, and so there is a lot to that, but you know, that is, I mean, you've been uh, kind of all over the map from a research standpoint, teaching, uh, and now really taking that to the, the, the masses, if you will, people that are maybe not in the, you know, the grad pros area, people that like general practice dentists who are interested in learning more about how, you know, airway and sleep medicine affects their practices. And, and really, maybe the first thing I'd like to ask you, I, we've heard kind of your story a little bit about what first got you into, you know, airway, breathing, sleep medicine. I know you've told that story before, but I think it really resonates with yeah, people uh, because it's more of a personal story. So we'd love to just hear a little bit about what first got you uh, interested in okay. investigating these things. Well, I mean, let me back up a little. And, I, and to your point, I hadn't really thought about it before, but Probably one of the reasons that um, that this material is connecting is I have done. Gen I was a general dentist for a dozen years, so and it was a family practice, and so it was uh, an environment that is most common in dentistry, and I'm used to that. And when I think about how do I, how would I make this work in my practice, I'm not thinking about how to make it work in a pros practice. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about how do I make it work in a general dental practice. And even down to the point of how would I make it work in a practice where you're in a group or um, you know, there's a bigger uh, corporate type of practice, how do we make it work there? Because we really do need to get to people um, and get this information out to them. So I, because I've experienced all those, I think we've formulated a way that it can actually happen. So we'll probably get to talking about that in a sec. But back to my story, in 2004, I came out and began practicing as a prosthodontist. In 2007, I started doing a research project on bruxism in my practice. And by 2008, we started finding the link between airway compromises and dysfunction and the possibility that people are grinding their teeth. Mm. And it wasn't, you know, it's not a 100% link, but it was at least something that wasn't on my radar and mm. most people's radar at that point in time that if you were trying to deal or prevent or resolve an airway issue, you may clench your teeth at that point or move your jaw around. And that's what was the beginning of it. And I started looking at sort of the fat old man with apnea and flat teeth and, yep. mm -hmm. and uh, erosion on their teeth. And it was all the rehabs that I was doing. And I kept finding more and more of them. So the more I started looking at airway issues, the more I really got back to well, where does it begin? Because I always ask the next question is kind of how my life has been. I never really am, am settled on the, the one. And I started asking, why did it happen? And I kind of got some of those answers. And then I said, when did it happen? Mm. And the minute I said, when did it happen? I started looking at kids and the kids grinding and the kids issues that they have. Mm. And then I realized that my son, Jake, had all those issues. Mm. And I was just about three or four years behind all of them. So when I would... Um, start reading articles about airway issues in kids, I think, well, that was Jake. Jake was the colicky kid, the kid that threw up on you all the time, the kid you could never, you know, keep in bed. You'd have to sneak out of the bed to, to try to get away from him, and he'd end up figuring it out and finding you. Um, the one that you'd have to finally put him in a car seat and drive him around the block just to get him to go to sleep at night. Wow. And so... Jake had had three surgeries by the time I realized what was going on, and he actually had started to do some orthodontic therapy at seven. And I finally was cluing in to what was happening with him and realized I had missed it all along. Wow. So when we finally got a diagnosis on him of ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, when I start reading the literature again, I realized that I had just missed it. Mm. Those airway issues may have been responsible for a lot of the issues that Jake's going to have to suffer with for a lifetime. And I made it my mission to try to keep that from happening to other kids. So every time I lecture, I always talk about Jake. And every time I talk about Jake, I ask people, who is your Jake? Mm. 
mm-hmm. and I want them to fix their Jake. Now we got tons of Jakes, right? They don't have to be kids. They can be moms, dads, brothers, sisters, grandma, grandpa. Um, but for sure, we got tons in, of your patients. So when you go back on Monday and you look around, the more you learn about this, the more you're going to start seeing it. You're going to just it, it will overwhelm you. Oh, that's true. Uh, that's how true. many airway issues, patients that you're going to see in your practice once you learn what to start looking for. Wow. And that's going to be a future question is, you know, what can a dentist do to go learn? And I I told the first time we came back from an educational event, John, and I text John, actually I called you and I said, dude, how many people have you seen today that have airway issues? Right. And then we start start talking about the pediatric cases and, you know, just it's crazy. Your eyes open to what um, has already always been there. And it's just we're seeing it in a different light now. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I appreciate yeah. what you've done to kind of to you know, help the, dentistry. The, and and I, I had been treating the apneic patient for 15 years by that point in time Wow! by making appliances. A friend of mine, Keith Thornton, developed the TAP appliance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he introduced me to that a long time ago. And I had, <laughs> I had actually been making them mostly for women. Um, the women would say, stop my husband from snoring. So I'd make them the appliance and the husband would wear it yeah. and everyone would be happy. Um, That's awesome. And so I had known about the, that patient. And when you go and you go to most of the lectures that I would, I would see, it would be about that person. It'd be about the person with excessive daytime sleepiness, with hypertension, with you know, all the medical issues. But they're kind of end stage. Yeah, it's the apnea, end game, right? It's like yeah. come full circle back yeah. to development. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when, and even then, when you start looking at that patient population, you still get overwhelmed by like by finding them. You say, God, they're everywhere. Yeah. But when you really start looking at the beginning of the disease process, where those patients started, I mean, you can't help but find uh, feel overwhelmed by how many people you have to deal with in your practice. Let me ask Um, you this. What is the place of dentistry in the role of treatment of sleep sleep disorder breathing? All right. So this this probably goes to either my personality or my training. But my my I think our role is to be the leader in the whole thing. Mm. Wow. I don't think medicine's ever going to make this better. I don't think they can. Hmm. Wow. So the way that I was trained as a prosthodontist <laughs> Write is... Write that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you said something profound there. Yes. Medicine's not going to lead the way we are. Right. That's I, amazing. I, yeah, so that's, that's a big responsibility. Big deal. So I was trained as a prosthodontist, and one of the, tra- the hallmarks of our training was um, that we had to learn what all the other specialties do. And we have to learn how to create a synergy between all the other specialties so that the patient at the end of therapy ends up coming out with the solution you want Yes. in a timely fashion. And so year after year, that's what I was taught and that's now what I practice. And so when I think about a patient coming into my, my practice and putting together a treatment plan, I'm thinking through what all the other specialties are going to do. I have in my head what they can do so that we get what we want. I see medicine as being another one of those, being my orthodontist or being my periodontist or my oral surgeon. In my head, when I'm looking at patients now, a a physician is just another tool that I'm using to get to an end point. And I really think that we're the ones that can, can do that way better than medicine can. First of all, because we think that way. Mm-hmm. All, everyone in this, in this meeting, every one of us thinks that way. That's how we are taught Multidisciplinary to think. approach. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I would go one step further. I would call it interdisciplinary. Okay. Multidisciplinary would, is probably the way that medicine practices now because a multidisciplinary approach, each, each person does their thing, they yes. finish, and then they pass it to the next person. Right. Right. It needs to be more interdisciplinary where they actually are working in concert with one another mm-hmm. rather than independent of one another. Medicine does really good multidisciplinary. Yeah. In fact, I have an ENT in my office, and that's what he'll say is, I'm not used to this. I'm used to me doing everything I possibly can, and then I'll pass it to the next. Yes. Right. And that's the wrong approach. The, you have to be able to do things in concert because no one person is going to solve this problem. You have to do every little piece. Um, 
so the the interdisciplinary nature is important and I think we're really we're the best at actually figuring that out and because we're used to it we do it every day in our practices medicine is not used to that and the other thing is medicine is used to dealing things with things uh, once the disease process is set in rather than doing mm -hmm. it preventatively mm -hmm. and we are all about prevention we want to keep it from happening and the final part is I really believe this is an anatomic issue at its mm -hmm. core mm -hmm. and we own the anatomy yes. Yes. yes so there's no one no ENT can change the anatomy That's right. the way we can all they do is if the anatomy is compromised they make things smaller to fit within a compromised situation yeah we're the only people that can take the anatomy that's responsible for breathing and alter it in a significant manner. And we can do it in the two, three, four year old, we can do it in the 40 year old, and we can do it in the 80 year old. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I know it, what you're quoting there, Stanford University study there that talked yeah. about, you know, 18 to 80 year olds being treated at severe apnea. They put, you know, temporary anchor devices, expanded their palate, and all of them went from severe to mild. Right. That's amazing. We yeah. can impact yeah. patients in that fashion like so, no other. So I want to go a little bit deeper into that. You mentioned interdisciplinary treatment because I, I think that as Wes and I have talked more since we've taken courses, especially at Spear, um, is you know we look at orthodontists being another key, potential key in our uh, treating this disease process because they are also maybe the most highly trained in understanding changes of growth and development mm -hmm. in in young people and as you said you know a lot of this starts with the young patient and understanding how we can influence it but yet we we seem it seems that there's more resistance and maybe maybe we're right or wrong you you would I'd like you to speak to that it seems like there's more resistance in the orthodontic community to the treatment of airway um, than in other parts of dentistry, and I'm not really sure why that is, other than maybe I feel there's a, and I don't know, again, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like there's maybe a concern that if we acknowledge the, how, how the incidence of this being so high, it starts at us having to have very difficult conversations with our, the parents of our young patients about maybe being more there's there's going to be more challenging treatment for these some of these patients there may be more surgical treatment there mm -hmm. may be more interventional mm -hmm. treatment at a young age I, I, and it maybe makes it to where it's not as easy quote unquote right. to just treat do you think that's the problem do you see that uh, being an issue yeah. with orthodontists and, and if so what can we how can we do um all right so every every community is going to have a roadblock to doing this some communities, the roadblock is the ortho. Some of it's the ENT, sometimes it's the sleep position. Um, every community is gonna have a challenge in putting together a team required to do this. Yeah. In many cases, uh, in many locations, it happens to be the orthodontist. And uh, I, I have asked the same question, why? Because I'm a huge advocate for ortho, and I think, in fact, they I think they're the people that bridge the gap between medicine and dentistry. That's I good. think they're the ones that are going to actually bring us together mm. because of their ability to mechanically alter the environment. So I, given how um, significant that role and my vision for them is, I, I always find it interesting when they aren't on board. Right. I think they would want to jump on board. It's right. crazy. So. Um, I don't, I would assume sometimes it is that it is breaking the normal flow of the patients. That we're doing something different that, that isn't their normal daily flow. And that happened a few years back when TADs were introduced mm -hmm. into orthodontics. Mm -hmm. And I would, I, you know, we've been doing intrusion off TADs for very complex ortho cases since the mid 90s. And it took years before that became popular and people would say the same thing to me hey I can't get my orthodontist to do that you right. just showed me that but I can't get him to do it yeah I think we may be in the evolution of the orthodontist is coming on board and eventually they'll they'll see it so some of them are growing into it but others are rather reticent to do it um, your point about does it bring up more difficult conversations part of it I was actually thinking last night it, about a, a study that was done on four by extractions and you would say well one of the reasons you wouldn't want to 
say that that causes a problem is you know the fear of litigation down the road. Yes. So conceivably, it's you don't want you know a whole, the world to, to all of a sudden say you took out teeth and made the airway smaller and therefore you made me well, see, I'm glad unhealthy. You, I'm glad you said it yes. because I think that that is maybe one of the elephants in the room. Uh, you know, I know when I've talked to my orthodontist and, and you know we start talking about the class two patient with maxillary crowding, and for many of these patients, the treatment plan has been upper premolar extractions. Nice and retract the teeth. And before, you know, some concern was brought up about oh, lip support, facial structure. But now the question is, well, you, are you telling me that I might be hurting these people and I might be killing these people or, well, or causing yeah, a constriction? Like there's a, a fear, yeah. I think, that, there, that, the, that is, could they be liable for the problem if we start talking about yeah, it? And I, I would assume there's got to be that somewhere in the mix, but uh, and there isn't going to there's never going to be science that says when you take out four buys that people are going to you know that this ultimately is going to end in their demise. That isn't going to happen because it just depends on the patient, depends sure. on their airway, it sure. depends on their adaptive nature. I mean it, it, that so it just probably isn't a great idea in some of the patients. We just don't know which one, so it, yeah. it kind of is a good thing to keep in mind in putting together treatment plans. Right. I think the to your point, the one that I found most interesting that you said that is um, the patients that uh, it's it's a harder discussion, and I agree with that because for so for a very long time, I would get notes back that says this is really a surgical case, but and what they do is they figure out a way to camouflage a surgical case yes. so that the smile looks good and the teeth come together. Right now, they may not come together perfectly, and they may not look as good. But for sure, what the, that line, this is a surgical case, but what they're saying is, I am going to not fix this possible airway issue because I don't want to go through the next step. Right, right. And so I really am, I'm significantly more, um, I'm, I'm more aggressive in my recommendations to the orthodontist. And once again, because I think of it as an interdisciplinary team, this team includes me saying, no, we're not going to do that. So not that's, just that's, turning it over to the orthodontist okay. and saying whatever you want. Well, so. that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where I think, again, like the challenge of, of us, like where the rubber meets the road, is once you know these things, you, you are faced with a, this decision of when it comes back from the orthodontist, and it's like you say, this is a surgical case, but... Um, how that discussion looks. Yeah. And no, I had one just difficult. the other day. I, um, there's a, a patient that uh, was very retronathic, but had great lip support and skeletally could have accepted, and aesthetically could have accepted the removal of upper first molars. Okay. And so the first molars are going to be removed. Everything was going to be retracted. She would have been beautiful. Hmm. She would have been fine. Hmm. Um, and so I saw that treatment and I thought, well, I understand why you're doing it because then the teeth will interdigitate and they aren't going to now. However, when I called him up, I said, here's the real issue. It isn't about her teeth. It's the fact that she's 14 years old, she has attention deficit, and she still wets the bed and can't go over to her friend's house Man. because mm. she has these problems. This is an airway problem and you're going to exacerbate this problem. And what was the response to that? I mean, so he, he the response was, yes, but you know the parents and they're not going to they aren't going to consider doing orthodontic. And I said, let me talk to them. That's and when I got them in and talked to them, they said, if that's what we need to do, if that's what we need to consider, then let's do it. And let's it's figure just it like, out. That's just like anything. You just have to give people a chance I think to, to choose the best I think parents want to do what's right for their children, exactly. and especially when you when you lay out the the, the, the whole treatment plan for what could be done. Yeah. You know, um, like just looking, you know, we will not go into this case particularly, but this is a case that I'm fortunate enough to have an orthodontist that has a CT scanner in his office that's able to evaluate airway. A 16-year-old that's, you know, class two skeletal. Sure, the easy treatment here would be take out upper buys, retract the maxilla. But then you look at what the CT shows in this particular case is airway constriction. And so, what this patient needs is orthodontic surgery, you know, possibly. Mm -hmm. And and so, if, I, the, if I'll go one step further, what 
she really needed us was for us to find her when she was mm. that's two or, exactly two or what I wanted you to say old. is that it's it's not about waiting to let the patient grow and speak to the fact of how early do we need to get involved yeah. as a dental yeah. community and be, and before before because I want to absolutely that I want to go that that's a perfect question I just want to ask you though do you think that with the discussion about orthognathic though becoming more common or more yeah. more in the discussion here, because I think there's been another, again, elephant in the room of, of reimbursement with yep. surgery. Yep. That's been a big problem as to why these cases are often not uh, yep. not talked about as much is that everybody's worried about, well, how am I going to get reimbursed for this? Right. Yeah. Do you think, do you see a move in the medical insurance uh, uh, that they are seeing the need for surgery uh, and maybe that Like that in a case change? like that right there. I no, mean, that, not in that case. How are you going to do that? So then? they're going to medical is going to only reimburse when they're sick. So so you got to prov- prove that she's severe is what you're saying. She's got to get sick, sick and, enough to, it, to oh warrant man. the she's reimbursement. She's got to get sick so, enough. You can't prevent right. future at correct. Or That's, you or you just have to say this is an out of pocket expense. It's an out of pocket. Uh, oh my so, word! So I'll, this I'll, is unreal. I'll give you a couple of, of sort of my tips for that kind of case. Okay. One of them is that. In your, in your adult population that have already are sick enough, the guys that come in, the people that are on CPAP, and they don't have to be the, the fat old guy. They sure. can just be, I mean, I just was having a meeting with a, a family that uh, yesterday that who their five-year-old has got problems, but the dad also does. Right. Yes. And he's 45 and fit, right. but he needs orthognathic surgery. And those kinds of patients conceivably are going to get coverage for it. Right, um, but the kids aren't. That that patient will not. Right, and so um, there are times when you have to have once again the conversation that this is worth every penny of what yeah. we're going to do. Right. So we're not the there other, yet from an insurance standpoint. No. And will we ever be? You're no. saying no. No, it won't. Man, not a chance. That's a shame. So, so parents yeah. are going to have to figure out a way to. I mean. If I'm making an investment, given that I'm, I've lived through this, right? Yes. So this is a parent yes. d- talking now. And granted, um, I've got resources that many parents are not going to have access to. I understand that. But it still would be a hardship to come up with the money, no matter right. where, no, what time in your life it is. Yet, if I had to pick a college fund versus orthognathic surgery fund, there you I, go. Would, I would get the orthognathic there you surgery go. That's done. that. Oh, oh man, so, I wanted to hear that. I mean, you know, people that are listening to the show, you know, this is a challenge. You know, again, you, you've heard it. You know, now that you've heard that, you can't ignore that. And I think this is the thing that is, it's hard to hear that. If you're an orthodontist, if you're a GP who's just starting to get into learning about this, I mean, that is a really hard truth. It's a truth, but the it's other, a hard truth. The other truth that I'll give you is that this is a, I see this as a one-off procedure. We're going to do this one time, we're going to do it right, and we're going to make an investment in, in, good. in my yeah. child, right? It's different yeah. than having to do Which revisions. Which means, well, and I don't know your community, but my community, I'm not having that surgery done in my community. Because mm. I've seen the surgeries, and right now in my community, we don't do enough of them to where the surgeons are as good as they used to be, in my opinion. Okay. So when if my son is going for orthognathic surgery, he's going to a handful of people I know that do it all the time. That's yeah. the only procedure they do. With respect to airway? Airway and Just aesthetics, everything. Because well, honestly, if you put the teeth in a position and the skeleton in a position that makes them breathe better, they're beautiful. They yep. are. Now, you can, you can take the case you just showed mm-hmm. and met, put, make them beautiful mm-hmm. and make them not breathe well. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So, so the understanding of the surgical technique, like you say, it's almost a lost art, it sounds yes, like. there's it th- is. Okay. So I've, okay. I've looked at cases I've had done recently and compared them to um, cases that, I, that I'm getting now and from other surgeons, the, a select group that I've picked. And one of the surgeons the other day after the surgery was very upset at his result because he was a half, his midline was a half a millimeter off. I like that. And the bite was socked in with a half millimeter off. And I was like, and it bothered holy him. smoke. Yeah, that's the kind of people <laughs> we like working with. I mean, with. this is amazing. Because so the orthodontist, it was basically done for yeah. the orthodontist yeah. at that point. So you, if I'm getting my kid worked on, 
they're not just going down the street to the local person. They're going to, mm. that one, and it's the same with ENT or whatever. Sure. Yeah. You want it, if you're going to do that big of an intervention, it doesn't have to be in your community. Mm. You got to keep in mind that this is a, these are one-off procedures and they don't have to be the guy down the road. That's good. So. I like that. So let's come back to, you know, we looked at a 16-year-old. We talked about a 14-year-old. We're talking about orthognathic surgery. We wanted to try to eliminate even chance of having that expensive surgery, even doing, having them put up against insurance per se. Let's talk about what can we do um, to help a patient from the time of birth until, you know, 18. Uh, really, we want to look at those first, you know, critical years of, of growth and development Talk to a little bit about myofunctional therapy. Speak to a lot of people know about Healthy Start out there and those programs. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about what we can be doing as dentists in those early years. Yeah, it's funny. I um, Because I'm so focused on Jake and, and getting these problems addressed early, um, people always ask me the questions about my experiences with all this. And um, I'm a prosthodontist, and so I don't... I don't treat kids anymore. That was the reason I got yeah, out of yeah. general dentistry. You know? I didn't like doing endo. Yeah, how many stainless steel crowns are you doing this year, right? <laughs> so, um, but I see a ton of kids in my practice because I want to. I put together a team that can actually do all this stuff. So, how do you? What do you promote early, and what do we promote early? Um, my hygienists in the office are myofunctional therapists, so they will talk to my, new mothers about. Uh, mm -hmm. the advantages of breastfeeding in craniofacial growth and development. Not mm -hmm. about nutrition, not about bonding with the child, just you can grow a better maxilla if you utilize it and utilize mm -hmm. the tongue. That's good. And so they're evaluating the, the child to make sure that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Now the thing that has changed dramatically in the last few years is, the, is figuring out what a tongue tie is. Yes. Because in my in my practice forever, a tongue tie was only the tongue that had that sort of heart-shaped invagination. So the kid screams and the tongue goes in and you go, okay, that's a tongue tie. Mm -hmm. But there are actually four classes of tongue tie and mm -hmm. two of which are in the posterior part of the tongue where we, you know, deeper into the tongue where I, I didn't even know they existed back there. Mm. And in fact, the back end of the tongue, the part that sits against the soft palate, if that can't rise, they don't breastfeed very well and yet you get fooled by it. The other part is the maxilla won't develop very well. Mm. So, um, so we talk and evaluate kids early on. And I think there's a big push right now um, to start doing that and setting up practices really focused on it. There's a, a fellow named JT Thomas up in uh, outside of Seattle. Mm. And JT is a, is a pediatric dentist that had five very profitable practices that he sold. And all he's doing now is... He's got a lactation consultant, a craniosacral therapist, and himself. And right day three of the child, because he doesn't go into the hospital, day three, if they're tongue-tied, he brings them into the office and does the surgery on them. And then they follow up with, you know, how to, you know, making sure that the child's growing and developing correctly after that. So um, there's an incredible health-based business model that I think mm -hmm. is going to help out kids a lot. Where do, the, where do the hygienists, just if I could interrupt just momentarily, if you have a hygienist mm -hmm. or someone who's interested in learning about that, where, where would they go? So it, um, there are different ways of learning, different groups that are, that are training people. Um, and so there's an international academy and an, an American academy, and they unfortunately are kind of battling each other right now hmm. so the american okay. academy will train anyone the international academy will only train speech pathologists and hygienists and dentists okay um there's a university like an online university-based course okay. so there are different ways of learning and certifying and so there's a you know you ask about healthy start there's a yeah. real bad thing going on right now and it's happening in a lot of different areas the first is myofunctional therapy where they're arguing with each other about what's the right way to be certified and yeah. what's the right training. And honestly, we're at a point right now where we need to train as many people as we possibly can. And then in the end, we'll figure out what's the best training. Okay. Right. And the better one will win out over time. So and then that will be the best service. Give us your top three areas where a hygienist could go right now or a dentist and start learning some of these things, myofunctional therapy. Um, all you got to do is Google myofunctional therapy because I'm not going to tell you which one. Right. Which one's the right one. Okay. You just 
Google myofunctional therapy training and go figure out which one's best for you and there's right a num now. There's a number of them you're saying. Are. That and are and they all are trying training. to kind of come to a consensus on what we should be teaching. They're just going to... It's, it's who, who trains it, how they train, how they certify, right. how they... It's, and That's right now, um, we're, I, I honestly don't care. That's the reason I'm not Right. I'm it's not just about getting patients say, treated. My orthodontist told me, he said, you know, he said anything that we can do from birth until I can get, you know, back brackets on them or expanders on them is going to help. Yeah. And so it's about getting that yeah. started. And you're saying as as early as three days. And I think I think a good, you know, as we're coming close to the show here, there's so much meat here, John. I know, I know. And one thing I'd love to have Jeff back on, um, as we've kind of been connected with Spear for a long time, and I know that we could do this, is I would love to talk about, because this is something that I've heard a lot about, is these four classes of tongue tie. Mm. And I'd like to do a show, some nuts and bolts about that, and what each one is. I think that'd be a great show. It would be, because that's something that I think, again, we talk about with our team as we've gotten so we're learning more about that is just screening and identification and then discussion with surgeons as well we need yeah. to have those tools uh, in, in, in addition to all of the all of the non-clinical screening that we're doing with right. discussion with parents and, and and behavioral things you know again these nuts and bolts of what do you look for in the mouth besides just tonsils and mom potty score and all these, we already know some of these things but that'd be a great show and, and you know really I, I think what I'd love for you to do just to kind of close close us out here Jeff just tell us a little bit about if, if someone listening to the show wants to learn more from from you because you obviously are involved teaching courses on how people can learn more about airway and sleep where would they tell us a little bit about what you do what you teach how they can get involved with you well the a couple of years ago, I sat down with Frank Spear and said, um, your way of doing facially generated treatment planning has worked for 35 years, but there's a new kid in town, and that's airway. And really, I think that you need to consider that. And interestingly, Frank was open enough to the idea of including airway as part of it, and not just sleep, because they, had, they already had a course in sleep there, making appliances and basically dealing with end-stage disease. I was saying that I think the airway dysfunction is the is something that you ought to look at proactively. So we've now included airway as part of the evaluation process for all the patients before we do any form of therapy. And so I now teach seminars at Spear. We do this year we're doing three of those seminars. They're two days in length. That's good. And then we created, as you said in the introduction, a protocol called the Seattle Protocol, which is how we walk patients through a series of steps to figure out where are they in the line of dysfunction? Are they a person that's just beginning to break down or you know, are they already broken down to the point where we need to make sort of a sleep appliance, a traditional version? Because a lot of times patients will come to you and say, I, you, know, you made me a night guard and I can't sleep without it. Right. Well, that person is breathing better with a piece of plastic. Right. So we figure that out and then from that we get clues as to how to fix the airway. What should we include in our treatment plan? Because in the end, I want to do away with the piece of plastic. Mm. I want to turn you into the piece of plastic. And that's exactly the dentistry that we've always wanted to do on those patients. So we teach uh, six workshops in that, which are three days in length. And the idea behind the workshop has always been that we're going to simulate you practicing with Greg and myself. And what would it be like if you were in our practice and how would you treat a patient? So they can go to the seminar for uh, a lot of information and uh, showing cases, but just as we've always yeah, seen you know, in the spirit, the, the, the workshop seminar, is really yeah. where you get into the hands-on. The seminar is really about finding Jake. Uh, so I want you to leave those two days and go home and figure out who they are, yes. not how to treat them. Yes. The workshops, what would you do if you were actually going to try to be part of the interdisciplinary team to treat them? Okay. I think it's great. And another place that I really think it's a great resource, once you've been to these seminars or if you want just a taste of Jeff Roush at Spear Education is to head over to Spear Online and become a member there. And for our listeners, um, we have a promo code for you, and it's TDG169, and you'll receive $20 off a month for the first year. And that's TDG169. 
169 and you get $20 off. And I know one of the great resources on there is the pediatric uh, evaluation form that you can take and employ in your operatory right now. Yeah. I have it in my office. I've put my brand on it and uh, gave, you, nice. gave, you, gave you the things. And I tell you what, I took that to an ear, nose, and throat doctor, or my, my assistant did, and guess what? I got a call back. He called my personal cell phone. He said, I want to sit down and have coffee with you and talk about this. Oh, I had a pulmonologist look at that t- this morning, and he, with my assistant, my uh, sleep champion that's kind of spearheading all this for me, and she, uh, she texted me and said he wants to get together with you. My orthodontist has now adopted that. And so you're making a difference in our practices, and I yes. want to thank mm-hmm. you so much for what you've done because you have impacted us. Uh, what Spear Education has done, the the yeah. courses that we've taken there, we're going to be taking the treating the worn dentition, which you know as well as I know is is like right up there right. with one of the favorite. Right, it's linked right in there, and yeah, we feel like what's as you said, it's a perfect extension for thinking yeah. about why things look the way they do. All this facially generated treatment planning. Many times the way they look, the reason they look the way they look, uh, the reason we're talking about bone and soft tissue and tooth position yep. and all of this is all coming back to how it begins as, yep. as you know, uh, an infant, as a young child, as, yep. and how we can affect that. And so it's So they're been, actually including me in that seminar now. So, oh, I love oh, it. Wow. So it, I love it. it ends up... Um, well, we'll see you then because we're coming out in yeah. April, yeah. I think. We'll yeah, be so out I'll, there. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be part of that seminar. And, you, and it's for that exact reason because it all now ties together. And, totally. And I don't, I don't do airway all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm cutting on teeth. That's I'm, good. I'm, yeah. I like so, to spin um, those burrs. Yeah. It's fun. No, if I, if there's no, you know, if I can't smell enamel burning by eight thirty, <laughs> right. something's not right. <laughs> right. So, so I'm, I'm not a I'm not a guy making appliances all the time. Right. I'm Leave us with teeth. one one last thing for our listeners about you know what they can do to kind of take it to the next level in their practice. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess what I would say is, you know, actually you highlighted the spear videos, and those of those people that have access to that, what I would do is is Play the videos for your staff because your staff members all have people in their world that are impacted by this. And if they saw the video of my presentation at the summit where we were talking about the three different patients that may be affected by it, someone in their world is impacted. And it's impacted pretty significantly by these airway issues. And once your staff makes it personal, then they, were, they will be on board with you doing whatever it takes to start helping people. And so I, that would be how I would approach it. Make it personal to your staff. And once your staff buys in, then it's really easy. It's amazing. Awesome. That. Well, Dr. Rouse, we really, again, appreciate you being on the show with us today. It fun, it's guys. been, been awesome. Uh, you've challenged us uh, to, to, again, to take it up a notch. And I think what... Uh, you know, what we want to also do is thank Spear Education for uh, allowing us to be basically a part of, of what you guys are doing and uh, being able to uh, get some of this uh, news out, the word out to people about what, where can they go to learn. And I think that's really what we're about in our show is about how can you, where can you go to get the very best information that's possible to where you can come back to your practice and, and employ this. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you to those who've watched this. Again, thank you to Kettenbach for sponsoring the live stream today. Uh, We'll be back with more from the Voices of Dentistry 2018.